Thank you for joining the October 10, 2019 Volta call. Just a reminder to everyone that these meetings are recorded and public and posted to our YouTube channel after the meeting concludes. And with that in mind, we have a couple of topics on our agenda today. So please be mindful of the public nature of the meetings during discussions and any presentations if we have those. So we've got two topics lined up for today. First one is a continued discussion on the device state transitions and actions that Ken had put together, and that has been sent out over Volta to discuss. I've copied the questions from the latest email over to the agenda on the screen today as well. We'll use that for our starting points. And then the second topic today is continued discussion from the last couple of meetings on the uh, discussion that uh, Mahir had raised up, and then we haven't yet gotten to 1975, Volta 1975. So we have allocated roughly an hour for that. Uh, we may need 90 minutes was the expectation, so we are looking to potentially extend today's meeting by 30 minutes if needed. So just an upfront notice or reminder different, I believe I did communicate that over email with this note here. With that, we'll go ahead and I think we can start the discussion. So Ken, I'll hand the, the leading over to you at this point. Okay, thanks, Julie. Um, so uh, we had this, uh, this document uh, that uh, we have to talk over two TST calls on uh, device state uh, changes, transitions, and actions that needs to happen. Uh, this document, uh, uh, there's, there's a number of changes that, uh, that we have talked about, spec specifically around like uh, state changes, like uh, uh, already the, like for example, the admin state, we don't have that, as many states that we used to, to have. Now we have only two, enable, disable. We are changing things around quite a bit. So uh, in short, what will happen is they'll, after we have reviewed the document and approved the document, we'll have a lot of changes that will need to go in, and both in the calls and the adapters. And I don't think that this will be done like in the short term. Uh, but in the document also, we talk about certain aspects that are more urgent to address. And, and the, the most urgent ones is what happened to flows uh, when ports goes down and up. Uh, in some cases, we're getting some uh, EAPOS flows and uh, we're not getting all the subscriber flows. And is it something that um, we expect the northbound to always push all the flows as is? Or do we expect the core to push flows that it has in memory at all time? And if we do that, are we looking at potentially the, the core doing something that may be in conflict with what the northbound is doing? So this is in short uh, what I think is the most pressing issues. So I'll open it to the floor and if anybody wants to, to, to have an opinion on this at this time. I think the one aspect with the northbound um, that's tricky is depending on different operator workflows, there may be different actions taken. But the piece here I um, want to bring up specifically is if no action or if northbound didn't explicitly say to remove something. Um, the scenario here is let's say northbound is, tol is telling ONOS and then the whole stack south add a subscriber flow. And then subsequently the port is dropped or, or downed or the device is down and the device comes back up again. And in this scenario, let's say northbound does not say remove the subscriber flow. In that case, the flow in ONOS, the flow in the adapters and the flow in the ONU still need to reflect that the last known good information has been told was the flow is still valid. Um, so that doesn't necessarily counter what northbound has doing. It's just if northbound never said remove it, it needs to stay. And that's the scenario that um, we're running into right now is if um, the northbound API doesn't explicitly say uh, bolt remove subscriber, in the case of a port going down, then bolt add subscriber, which is the last good command adding the VLAN, 
is still in effect. It's still a, um, a valid flow all the way down. And in that situation, there are workflows that assume that the subscriber VLAN hasn't been set and then sets the default VLAN for, um, let's say, open o or the ONU tech profile uh, task and basically preventing ePoll or subscriber flows or traffic from even working. Right. So, from, so, okay. uh, oh, so, so if we look at the hierarchy here, so if, if at the physical OLT, there's no expectation that the physical OLT will remember anything, right? So if I, let's say I rebooted the physical OLT, it would come up and it would expect to receive all the flows that were installed at one point before it rebooted, right? The physical adapter, I mean, the, the, the OLT adapter that's, that's running uh, in the cluster, if it, it still has a memory of all the flows it has, so if the OLT goes away, I guess it would be the one that would uh, refresh the physical OLT state. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I think that, and I think that could happen. So I, I do think the adapters need to protect themselves. Um, ONU has OMCI MIP to do this. The OLT adapter to do the same thing. Um, if it were left just up to that, I think we could work through this without having to ask the core or having the core repush flows at all. The trick is when the um in the case of northbound when the uh, epoll flows are removed and re-added by let's say uh, open olt or the olt app in nem if those uh, that app is is coded to remove e flows and add them when the port goes down and back up if right. further north nothing has said remove the subscriber flow then that e flow now should be capture and tag ePlows using the subscriber VLAN using the default VLAN. And what ends up happening in that scenario is the flows as re-instructed by Onos tell the OLP uh, adapter, take subscriber VLAN 20 and look for EEP, and then tell the ONU adapter, take VLAN 4091 and tag that. And it's that scenario right there where nobody said remove VLAN 20, where both adapters are now taking divergent paths. Right, right. So, but, so but my concern, my, my my concern here is if the ONU adapter has one level of persistence of what flows should be on a device, and the OLT has another uh, concept of persistence and what it thinks the device should have, and most has a third, we're trying to keep essentially three persistent storages in sync. It seems right, to me that right. Onos is the authority at all times, and if the ONU goes down, reboots, and loses loses its mind, that should be reported up, and Onos effectively should be taking care of that. That that loss of mind should flow all the way up to Onos. See, Onos would query and see flows missing and push them back down. Right. So, so if if, if we follow the the flow, if when so the OLT gets rebooted, for instance, right? So now once that goes away. The, the OLT adapter, it had the flows, but because the interface has gone down, ONOS is going to withdraw all those flows, right? So the, the OLT adapter doesn't doesn't have any flows at any point anymore, right, for that OLT. Now, when, so that that's withdrawn from the, the core, from the OLT adapter, and from the physical OLT just because it's been rebooted. But once the physical OLT comes back up again, uh, now it's going to go through the whole process where it's got uh, as the ONUs come in the range in um, and they're going to get the authentication flow added by ONOS right because now the interface yep. has come back up again so so basically like, as, you, as you say I mean ONOS is the one that's keeping the flow state for the OLT once it goes away right so the, the case where the ONT goes away or the ONU goes away is handled because ONOS withdraws all the flows and ONOS has those flows that need to be added, right, once those things come back. So Yeah, ONOS is the, the authority in this case. It's just right. a situation where, as told by ONOS, it, the, the ONOS says, add, add the ePoll flow, right? It just so happens ONOS also says, add the ePoll flow for a subscriber VLAN. 
and in that scenario now, both, you know, whether or not the ONU or OLT adapter remembers anything from before, they're going to honor what is told by ONOS. It just so happens in honoring that the uh, OLT adapter will take that VLAN 20 flow for ePoll and actually set that up as instructed, but will then proceed to tell the ONU setup tech profile, which at this point doesn't take a VLAN argument, and it just assumes 4091. So both have been told through what Onos tells me to do. It's just both now through, you know, kind of hard coding, I guess, take different paths. That initial hard coding works because when that first flow first shows up, 4091 is what we want to use. The, 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 the wrinkle right. here it seems, is... It seems to me it should be, as you said, parameterized, right? It, it, yeah. The tech profile yeah. needs to be able to yeah. take a, thought, a VLAN. Yeah, I thought that was added. So, no, well, so this gets to you know, kind of the tangent of this with some of the device state stuff. But so there's another way of approaching this that I can't remember where it was brought up. But right now, flow decomposer, I think for trap uh, trap flows, will only tell the OLT about them. The OLT, in getting that trap flow, will set it up on itself and then proceed to send the tech profile task to the ONU. In effect, this is basically telling the ONU to add a flow. It's just the OLT is basically performing that little bit of decomposition on its own um, because the ONU is only being told to add a VLAN tag. It's not actually, well, it's doing other things with zero ports and things like that, but it's also saying add a VLAN tag. The idea might be to have the core when decomposing control bound flows to tell both the OLT and the ONU, instructing them, this is the right VLAN I want you to use. OLT will proceed to do what it's been doing al already, run the tech profile task, but the tech profile task doesn't set up any VLANs. The ONU will get the tech profile task, set up all the PBIT mappers and things that need to be done, but then from the core get told what VLAN to use. Yeah, I mean, the, a, a flow needs to be added, right? So that flow includes the tagging, the match, you know, match rules, the tech profile. Yeah. That, that should be just yeah. the same, whether it's a EA poll flow or a service flow. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is the the tech profile task to me makes more sense for it to not take on the job of assigning VLANs. It would be better to have the job of assigning VLANs be done in one place. Yeah, I, I thought so that, that was in ONOS, mm -hmm. including the bandwidth profile for the EA poll flow as well, not just the VLAN. Oh, and that's what the ONOS side it is. It's like ONOS will, will do what it's doing and then give it to the core. It's just in the core. Right now, it only tells the OLT adapter, the parent, what to do. And then now it's on the parent adapter to then subtend that flow via the tech profile task to the child. So there's two ways of solving it. One way, the simplest way, is really just to pass the VLAN ID argument as the tech profile uh, inner adapter message. Um, it's just really we get back to, well, maybe we shouldn't have that task setting VLANs at all. Maybe we should have the assigned VLAN task setting up the VLANs and it doing it regardless if it's an ePoll or a subscriber or anything else. Yeah, I think that would make the most sense to me. I mean, but... uh, uh, Matt, from the discussion that we had with Sovrav, uh, did he kind of mention that uh, if, uh, based on the operator flows, uh, the upper layer somewhere in them, uh, that they will need to add uh, and Add, remove and add that subscriber, and that will potentially solve that issue. Um, yeah, it would. That's so. That's just it. Is if if northbound takes the workflow action to remove that subscriber, then it in effect goes back to the default 4091. I guess the scenario I'm talking through is is if northbound doesn't do that, we're left in a situation where, you know, do we faithfully honor northbound whether it tells me something or Shin tells me something or do we assume that in this case you know, but I, I thought onos was driven by the link state um, independent of whether there's a provisioning operation so right now, the OLT app will rescind the ePoll flows based on ink state, 
the OLT will not resend subscriber flows. That is purely the responsibility of northbound operator. So in the situation where northbound operator does not resend the subscriber flows, we're now left in a, well, what do we do well, situation? Well, but, then, but that's a, a configuration <laughs> operation. Once I've configured a subscriber, then whether the flows are added or removed is based on the authentication state of that subscriber, right? So if, if, all, if, the, if, the, if the subscriber flows were there and it was authenticated, then the OLT goes away or the, um, or the ONU goes away, that, that subscriber is now considered unauthenticated. And so then ONU should withdraw all the flows, including the subscriber flows well, until authentication. So this is where, this is where you know, kind of saw I've made the distinction of what is the responsibility of further notice of ONUS. Um, it seems that this, that particular action, that API to remove the subscriber is wholly in the realm of the operator callback. Well, we're not we're not removing the subscriber. I mean, the subscriber is still there. It's just it's just unauthenticated. Yeah. Well, and that, and that's just it. Is the, the um. The, I guess the best way to kind of describe this scenario is a um. Um, if if we track link state on the Uniports better, which we will at some point, then just unplugging and replugging an RG would leave you in a state where you couldn't re-authenticate, because the subscriber flow is still there. The port went down in Onos. Onos rescinded and re-added the EAP flow, but left the subscriber flow intact. But now neither EAP nor subscriber traffic would actually work. So you're forced, the, the northbound interface in this situation is forced to take action north of Onos to say volt remove subscriber. If that is not called, then authentication can't happen either. I, I it really bothers I, me. I, I, Volta I, to I'm, I'm, depend on a northbound thing, else Volta will get the device in an odd state. Right. I, I don't. I don't think this is a northbound. I, I don't see this as a northbound requirement either. This, this should. This should. I mean, the northbound has said we want this. We want this service, and northbound has never said we don't want this service. So right. to make the northbound say we want this service again, even though we already told you we want this service, just because we the device rebooted or a port rebooted or or something rebooted or something happened, that doesn't seem quite right. Yeah, I guess it's back to we haven't told you we don't want this service anymore. So if I haven't told you I don't Correct. want it, I want it. Yeah, and and it's just all that matters there is the authentication state. It seems right. I mean, if it's unauthenticated, it doesn't have any flows. So, I think kind of yeah. whether the core repushes on its own, I, I work around that by having the adapter. If it needs to remember something, it forgot to ask. Um, so there's a, a question. Yeah, I, 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 I it's. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that it's the core that I don't know that it's Volta's job to do it. I, I kind of would. I don't know. If, I, I think um, so. I, I don't know who was saying it a second ago, but um, I think it's Onos's job to do it. Yeah, well, so Onos ultimately will. It's almost like regardless of what core might remember for that split second when it comes back up, Onos is going to come right back on the heels and say, repush these flows. And that, that does flow down. It's just when that does flow down, there's contradictory decompositioning happening, depending on what might have been there before. So fixing that doesn't so much have to do with either asking Onos for flows again or Onos or, or asking core for flows again or core repushing the flows. That is really just a question of we need to either pass the VLAN argument into tech profile task or have decomposer pass it as an independent uh, flow push. Um, I think we can deal with that that way. The uh, the the ask for to remind me what my flows are for whatever reason, regardless if Onos comes back on the heels and says something different seconds later, we would honor both. It would just be in the case of the adapter restart. I forgot everything. Tell me what I need to know. So Matt, uh, uh, from uh, what you are proposing, uh, well, one of your proposal in in uh, flow decomposition. Uh, do we know for sure that at this stage that uh, we will be decomposing those uh, trap flows, the controller trap flows, that we will have, uh, it's the right time to 
decompose the ONU flows and send them to the ONU adapter. Is it, uh, are we sure at that time that we'll have authentication done? Or it doesn't matter? So in this case, this would be the pre-authentication, just the EPOL trap flows. By the time the EPOL trap flows are pushed down front to the core, the ONU is up, the uniports are up. Basically, it's ready to receive that configuration. Um, the, the, the question, I, and I have to go look at the flows to remember, is does ONOS actually push the specific operator VLAN, the, the catch-all walled garden VLAN that we lovingly call VLAN 4091, is that completely pushed from northbound? I think it should be. I think it should be something configured in one place that everyone uses. But either way, um, both the OLT and the ONU are ready for it by the time that flow comes down. Including the one in the tech profile. Yes, Just that was yeah. Well, so the subscribe. So at this point, we're actually not setting up the subscriber flow. So if if we did, it would it would still be ready for it either way. It's almost like you could if we completely skipped EPOL, didn't do it at all. And we really just went with the simplified setup of add a subscriber VLAN to this port. If that happened from the get go, obviously we'd still have to push uh, some tech profile to get the gem ports, the uni port uh, lined up for that. So that has to happen regardless. It's just the e poll part wouldn't happen. Um, but then the subscriber VLAN coming on the heels of that would again be just as timely and appropriate for the OLT and the ONU. And, and the nice part about that too okay. is it, it it now makes it so where if the core tells the OLT and the ONU to remove VLAN flows, regardless if it's for ePoll or subscriber, there's now one way in to do that, for both adding and removing. So you're suggest, suggesting not only when, for example, when a point goes up, we push those flows, but when the port goes down, we remove those flows. Um, in this case, I don't think the core has to do anything. I think Onos, when the port goes up and the port goes down, will will take this action. So um, that's kind of why there are two different parts to this. Um, in this scenario, the core repushing anything from a, a automatic point of view doesn't need to happen. Onos will will take care of that because it gets the link state. Um, the repushing flows part happened, or that part of the conversation came up when, well, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of good remembering by the adapters. But I think getting the adapters to remember what they need to do would, would kind of help them along. You know, and maybe the remembering what they need to do, regardless of what Onos, you know, happens to come along later and say, might be just the, the um, asking the core again which I even think asking for the device will get you the flows either way. So there may already be a mechanism to do this. So I'm saying yeah, the core, mm -hmm. core repushing, I don't think we need to do. Core changing how it decomposes for trap flows, I do think we need to do. Uh, and that will apply only for uh, trap flows. Yeah, so it would actually end up making the trap flow, if, if I remember correctly, look a bit more like the unicast flows, where there's one sent to both the parent and the child. I just think right now the trap flows, I think the only the parent gets. Yeah, um, only the parent uh, but, gets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think that, you know, having it sent to both, you know, takes some of the, the presumption away from the OLT adapter, making its life a little bit easier. And the ONU can then just faithfully do as it's told with the VLAN. Right, and and there are all kinds of uh, match action rules that are kind of implicit um, that are not explicitly stated, right? So by sending down the flows, you basically take that out of the assumption slash, slash implicit steps, right? I mean, yeah. The, so the one piece that in this case the OLT adapter would still do is setting up the tech profile proper, right? It would be the adding the, uh, the 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 p bit mapper to the bridge on the ONU, adding the um, the uh, any of the uni related configurations, any basically anything else other than actually setting up VLAN filter or extended VLAN tagging operation. 
that would only happen only when the decomposer says add this VLAN. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The tech profile task, the OLP, still needs to kick off on its own because it knows about manager elements, the, the ALEC IDs, the GEM IDs, the ONU IDs. That, that bit still needs to be uh, a proxy, if you will, through the OLT because it is the authority in that space. It's just flow of uh, VLANs are the authority of ONOS and it needs to flow through Decomposer. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense to me uh, to do that. Um, any other opinions on that? Concerns? So, so now the uh, flow add and remove is driven, if, if we move down this path, so that's all driven by ONOS, right? But, and that ONOS is driven by the link state of the, um, essentially the, the uh, uni. Um, link state in northbound, depending on who, what side of provisioning is being done. Like if it's link state, ONOS will send the eat traps autonomously on its own. But if it's uh, anything else, basically, um, it's northbound telling it to do it. But in all cases, it's ONO saying to Volta, set up these VLANs, set up these ports, on these VLANs on these ports. Yeah, so that's, that's creating the subscriber information. The subscriber information doesn't get implemented until um, authentication occurs for that subscriber, right? And the authentication step is still driven by ONO sending down the, yeah. the, the, the trap flows to uh, right. OLT and ONU, right? Right. Um, and, and ONOS provides a, a default bandwidth profile, a default tech profile. Um, so all that information is, is actually owned by ONOS and sent down by ONOS based on the, you know, moving through that step of discovering an ONU, then moving to trying to authenticate the ONU. And then once authentication occurs, then the service flows are sent down. If the ONU goes away, um, then, uh, so link state goes down, then ONOS will withdraw the flows, include, you know, that, that got set up for that subscriber because now it moves to the unauthenticated state. And when it comes back, it needs to go through that whole process again, same process. So this is where the removal of the subscriber flows is still left up to northbound, um, discretion, right? Well, no, no, no. I mean, no, no. I mean, today, no, it's not the removal no. of the flows. It's the removal, removal, removal of the subscriber is left in northbound. Right. Well, That's a provisioning yeah, yeah. operation. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Same thing. All right. I get it. Um, so the uh, um, there was one other scenario. Uh, oh, yeah. That's right. So in the scenario where an operator doesn't want to run ePoll at all, right, this is a similar case where you know, northbound may not be driven by ePoll saying add or remove something. The ePoll functionality may be turned off and it may purely be set up a subscriber VLAN on this port and I want it to always work, right? I'd never yeah, want that to be removed. Yeah, yeah. by default, it's, it's authenticated it's immediately, right? There is no, the authentication step doesn't exist. It just It's automatically authenticated, right? So in that case, yeah, all else would just send down all the subscriber flows right away. But that would then also be withdrawn I guess if the ONU goes away. If the ONU is not there, then those flows would be withdrawn. If it, if it comes back, then it would be added again automatically without having to authenticate. Is that a point of contention? Um, well, it's the automatically part. Who um, Right now, the ONOS apps are, the, I guess, the kind of the, the view of our mechanism of automation, right? So. For the ePoll, it is as you described. If there is no ePoll, then if there is no ePoll and no API further north says remove the subscriber, then the subscriber flows are still there and are not removed when link state goes down and up. Uh, well, I mean, it, if you do that, then it becomes a little inconsistent, right? Because now, we're, we're saying that if I if I say I don't want to have something like e, e poll authenticate, 
I'm going to say that that flow is provisioned all the time. Yes. I mean, right, so, so the the, comp, the the analogy I can think of is, you know, configuring a switch port statically VLANing, you know, access port VLAN 20. And nothing is said, remove that. The operator didn't go in and say, remove it. I may have unplugged the port, but the right. port is still configured to be VLAN but, 20. But now, but now there's a requirement that somebody else persists the information, right? If, if Onus is doing everything, it's the only one that needs to persist. If, if now I say, once I configure it, Onus is out of the picture, besides pushing the initial flow, now somebody else has to make sure that flow still exists once some kind of restart occurs, right? I mean, if the EA pull is, or the authentication is automatic in this scenario, i.e. just essentially we're skipping that step, why wouldn't again we follow the same pattern when when the port goes down remove it and when the port goes back automatically add it it's just onos controlling when that happens yeah this is where we got to discuss this off there there is there is a threshold that was defined where olp app makes certain decisions about flow removal and addition and the rest of it was left up to through the subscriber api northbound See, I think the subscriber API says, is there a subscriber on this port? And if so, almost acts appropriately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think anything else should drive this besides Onos having a subscriber state. If it doesn't exist, then the subscriber flow doesn't exist. So, I mean, maybe the question here is, is should the OLT app or Onos in general pull or resend all flows when the link goes down regardless and then when it regardless of what well i'm so saying so it, it's now a question of right now it removes an add epoll flow as coded the olt app does but if we say we have the olt app remove epoll flow and subscriber flows then is it going to automatically add those back because northbound Volt add subscriber, last time it had made the API call said, Volt add subscriber, not Volt remove subscriber. Well, so basically, so if, Onos, if, if Onos has the subscriber information, and let's say, you know, we, we remove that northbound API, right? So now Onos has a subscriber. If the link goes down, all the subscriber flows are removed. If the link comes back up again, then it has to authenticate and download the subscriber flows. If authentication is not required, then it just downloads the subscriber flows. So that's the thing is today, what does not happen if, if, if northbound provision subscriber and then disappears, never comes back again, just in this example, Onos, you know, again, is told about the subscriber flows, adds them. But when the port goes down, it only removes the EPOL flows. The, it does not remove the subscriber flows. The subscriber flows still stay. Well, that's that's not allowed, right? Because well, in the in the case where where there's no authentication, then yes, in theory it could do that. But now somebody else has to remember that those flows exist, right? Besides own. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's far better to have consistently and say just remove everything and re-add everything. That would seem consistent. Yeah. Right. I mean, the you know we'd have to look at the downsides of you know having to add all that, <laughs> you know having to do all that stuff. But but at least the the operational model is consistent. So you know, trying not to turn this problem into you know fifty problems. I think yeah, that is something we could probably have to discuss with Sar because he might represent some of the northbound interactions a bit more um so let's just put a table that we, one we just for a talk second it, we can talk it over with but my, my point being that volta has to be consistent with volta volta cannot be oh, I hey can. i work but only in the context of a given you know nem right i i agree my, my point is is if you know you know we i want to try to focus on at least the one or two problems i know that volta can solve on its own regardless of what onus is doing and then we could kind of deal with Onos and its northbound interactions, you know, in a, in a separate, you know, two hour long conversations. Uh, uh, Matt, if, if the OLT app remove and add all flows, 
will we still get in this problem? Um, yes, we would. That's the thing is this is why the, the decomposition piece needs to happen anyway, because if Onos repushes all the flows like we we're describing, we want it to, OLT app would tell itself, will tell the hardware V920 and then tell the ONU 4091 and then nothing would work. Okay, so so it, uh, it will push all flows, but not subscribe the flows. Uh, it depends on the order. That's the catch. If the ePoll flow happens first and then subscriber flow, it work. If the subscriber flow happens first and then the ePoll flow, it wouldn't work. Um, if we do it where decomposition does the right thing, well, pushes the subscriber or the any VLAN flow to the ONU at the appropriate time, the order doesn't matter anymore. Well, it, it does, right? Because yeah, the, the EA poll is subsumed under the subscriber flow. If, you know, like, so if I add if I add an HSI service, then EA poll uses that, uh, you know, TCON gem to function, right? I mean, uh, well, okay. maybe I spoke. It, it the ultimately from the ONU's point of view, regardless if it's a subscriber VLAN or the default VLAN, something is telling it set up this VLAN, right? It could be this VLAN 4091 for the purposes of only capturing, or it could be yeah. VLAN 20 for capturing ePoll and other stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's when yeah. they're inconsistent, that's the problem. Yeah, so I, th I think it's essential that the, you know, the EA poll flow is handled like any other flow. Yep, it's, it's created from ONOS, it get, or it gets created and removed by ONOS, right? So it, I, I, I think that is fundamental to, this operation. Yep. Uh, is it possible to uh, for the uh, decomposition to do to decompose subscriber flows, send the right uh, VLAN down, and then decompose the EU pole and send the wrong VLAN VLAN down? Yes. Because they have to. They 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 don't. Ex they can't exist together, right? You, you can only, no. you can have EA, EA poll flow, or you can have a subscriber flow. No, the EA poll is repushed after. So when the subscriber flow is pushed, the EA poll flow is repushed with the subscriber VLAN being the capture VLAN. Right. So basically, exactly. the yeah. ONU doesn't okay. send anything out to VLAN 4091 anymore, or whatever the default is. Um, yeah, so okay. the EA poll flow has to exist by itself initially for authentication purposes. Once yeah. the subscriber flows are pushed, then EA poll is subsumed under that flow. And the original yeah. independent yeah. flow goes away. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So, yes, that happens. When the subscriber flow, subscriber workflow happens, the EA poll flow is subsumed in that process. And I want to do it. I want to do a time check because we're about five minutes over our our time to date. Do we need to? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how much progress we can make today, or if we need to schedule another time slot, or how we want to proceed. Uh, ideally, I would like to, if we can, like at least uh, conclude on some at least this item. Yes. Because there are some other juras and code submit that are holding up because of uh, of this discussion. So let's let's do this. I think um, today, if you query the device when you do get device, it returns the entire proto, including the flows, um, which you know brings up. Other questions but anyway I think there is a way for the adapter to go either adapter to go and get whatever flows the core knows about and thereby what Onos knows about at any time so I, I think that mechanism is okay we don't have to have any autonomous pushes from the core in this case um, that's my opinion um, I also think that having decomposer decompose for trap flows to child and parent would make things more consistent that would fix the I, I believe it would fix the issue we're experiencing now. And then I think the only, the rest of the conversation really is about ours. Are we good with the bigger picture device state changes 
um, that Ken is describing. Yeah, uh, the in terms of the uh, just one item, uh, there, Matt. When you mentioned that uh, the adapters can go and get uh, their flows, uh, I'm talking more about uh, the questions that we had was uh, if a device goes, if, for example, if we reboot a device, uh, should the core push flows for that, as an example, or if we when we disable or enable a device, should the core push all the flows? Like, uh, those are the questions that we have. It's like, uh, what are the conditions under which we expect the core to repush flows on state well, changes? Well, w once the link comes up for an ONU, on an ONU uni, its flows should be pushed, right? And that's going to be paced. It's not going to be all at once. It's going to be as, the, as that ONU uni comes up that the flows will be pushed. First, the authentication flow and then the subscriber flows once authentication occurs. So it's not going to be just a bulk push of everything, I, I don't think. The um, the scenario I think here that might make more sense is if the adapter itself is restarted. In that case, it may need to get out everything it knows to it, at a minimum check against what the hardware is configured to make sure they're still the same. Right, right. Um, but whether that's a push on you know the entire device or the entire adapter going down or not, or whether the adapter can decide to go get that at the time it makes most sense. Maybe, you know, it, it, it's done its initial reconciliation and it's to the point where, oh, we need to go and pull from the core to make sure everything still matches. It might do right. that when it's ready. Right, but that, that's a different scenario, right? So now we've moved on from the, you know, the, the state-driven scenario on the, the link state, right? We've moved on to, now we're into this recovery and sync state where, either an adapter restarts or the core restarts. In either of those cases, they're gonna to have to go and sync themselves up with what the state of the physical OLT is. You don't wanna take that OLT down and stop service while it syncs back up again, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is where the different adapters you know, do, do a job of protecting themselves. Um, ONU has OMCI to do this. So ONU already takes care of it through its reconciliation process. OLT adapter might need to have something similar in regards to the adapter still running, the OLT either disappeared from the network and came back fully configured or disappeared from the network and came back with no configuration. If the OLT adapter remembered enough about what the configuration was, it could either compare and say, don't change anything or compare and say, repush what I need to repush and not actually have to what, add the core or anything. Why, why can't the adapters just faithfully report what's on the device and that reconciliation happen in Onos where it does today with the Ethernet switch? So the problem is, is there are certain PON related configuration elements that may or may not bubble up into Onos. Um, certain like IDing for resources on the PON, certain IDing for uh, resource manager configuration elements, right? You know, Onos just says set this up and then the OLT through its knowledge of the hardware says, all right, these five ALEC IDs belong to you and these scheduler IDs belong to you. And the same thing for ONU OMCI. Um, okay. If both of the hardware devices restart, all that has to be reset anyway because all your old IDs are gone. But if the transport between them dies and comes back, we don't want to have to blink all the ONUs and OLTs just because we have to, you know, uh, just because they went away and came back, we could compare and say, you still have everything you have, adapter still has everything I have, it's still the same, don't touch anything. I guess, do we need to be careful and say, let Onos be the master of those things, Onos, within that, that division, and let whatever is the other master, the, the resource manager, be the master of the other stuff? Or, or are you yeah. talking about saying, hey, there's always gonna, you know, there's gonna be this intermediate that knows everything, and it'll push down from it. Yeah, so some of this, the push down will happen just by virtue of the link state going down anyway. Um, if, let's say in this scenario, the transport between Volta and the OLT go down and come back, the adapters and then the core would represent, I think, if I remember or look correctly, link state either unknown or down for everything, which would get back to Onos. So when Onos sees it all come back, it'll repush either way. Uh, will Onos will push everything down? It, it depends on operator behavior. Let's put it that way. This uh, 
EAP flows, yes. Subscriber flows depends on NEM, really. And uh, in that case, if the core has certain flows in it, should the core will push those flows to the adapters? If the adapters are still running, I mean, let's put it this way: if it did, yeah, I think the adapters are stored up, they're missing flows. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't hurt. I put it this way: if the adapters are still running, and it has, it remembers knowledge, and the core sees the device behind the adapters come back, and it repushes flows. The, the uh, old team will then just faithfully say, "Yep, we need whether it's a no op because it's the same." That I already have or not. Well, but the, the two scenarios one one is the one driven by link state, and the other one is the the uh, uh, adapter uh, restarts. In which case, it needs to go and ask ask for the information, the flow information from from above, right? I mean, there may be some kind of audit scenario yeah. as well, but but just just from from a, a restart perspective. The, the adapter would need to go and ask the core about what flows exist. Yeah, there's a reconciliation that will, will need to happen between the core and the, and the adapters yeah. during that, that phase. And right. more, it's, I'm more talking about the, the link uh, change, state change. For example, if, the, if an adapter comes back and says a device uh, which was not active before or at, at some point in time was active and is no longer active, now became active again, Chances are some of the ports have changes, so owners will know that the ports have been enabled now, so they will push some flows. But if they are not pushing all the flows, there may be some flows in the core that were there. So I would assume that the core will need to turn around and say, okay, I have all those other flows on that device. I'm going to take that and push it down. Is a win agreement with that. So in this case, Onos would still have those flows too. Yeah, but would they push every, all the flows? They, they may push some of the flows, well, but would they push all the flows? Onos will push all, uh, Onos queries the device, and if the device, and then reconciles what the device thinks it has with what Onos thinks it has, and then pushes flows to add or delete based on that reconciliation. Right? Yes, but uh, we just talked earlier that uh, there are some flows that don't don't get pushed down. It, it I don't know. It it's really bothers me that Onos, who is supposed to be the master of the flows, is we're injecting flows from the side. We're saying injecting pawn specific resources, but flows. Yeah. Yeah, is a problem. It, it, it seems like um, you know, if, the, if an adapter goes away and then comes back, and there is no, you know, backup adapter that's running, then Onus would need to go and audit the adapter for the link states, I assume, right? Otherwise, it, it won't really know what to push. Because so one of the uh, one of the Jira that uh, that is in code review at this time is to because of some uh, certain situation like some flows are, are not being pushed. Uh, that comment is every time we change the state of the device that became active, we automatically turn around and push whatever flows we have in the core towards the devices. No, but it, it should have. Um, I mean, that the core should not have the, that those flows at that point if it was down, right? I think the it would have some down? flows because I. No, not the core goes down. No, it's uh, the, when the device state change. Yeah, uh, but, but if it if it if it if it went down, then the core shouldn't have the flows for that device at all because owner should have withdrawn them. Should have. So in this case, 
working with a scenario where it doesn't, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Right, I would say even if Onos doesn't remove them and doesn't tell the core to remove them, then as downstream faithful operatives, they're still valid. Whether or not Onos needs to remove them or not is a good question. Right, but, but, but we, we said that the, you know, the core wouldn't push, wouldn't give the adapter any flows unless asked to by Onos, unless there's a request from the, the OLT adapter to, to synchronize. Right. right. But so, again, it gets back to that scenario where Onos never said remove anything. So it's still there. Right, but but now Onos is out out of sync with the state of the physical OLT, physical OLT or the ONU, right? And when Onos tries to reconcile and sees something there it doesn't want, it should try to remove it. Right, and if and if the adapter goes away, um, you know, there's, there's a we have to be careful because we don't want to withdraw all the flows because just the adapter's gone. It's only when the physical equipment is gone that you want to withdraw the flows, right? Because otherwise, if we could just take down all the service right, because something restarted. Well, yeah, that's so why currently, they... there's, yeah, currently there's a uh, flows are not removed and then adapter goes away. There's, uh, there's no notification that goes no found at this time. It means those right, flows so, remain as is. But if the adapter goes away, then owner should know that it's going to have to audit state, presumably. Because now it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's not in sync with the physical OT anymore because it's yeah, communication correct. Was going away, right? Yeah, correct. Like uh, what I meant is like currently uh, there's no notification going up. It's uh, it, it will eventually need to, but uh, there's none at this time. Yeah, so I think that that kind of reconciliation has to happen somewhere, right? Because owners need to go and get in sync with the physical OT state. So, what are we concluding towards to? Boy, it'd be great if someone could write this up. <laughs> <laughs> what was that JIRA you mentioned, the one that uh, we talked about repushing flows? Do you know what it is off the top of your head? Uh, it's, no, I'm, I'm just going to look for the code, actually. Let me see which one is it. Uh, one question. So let's say the adapter goes away and it comes back up. So the first thing that it's going to do is reconcile with the hardware, right? Before the audit starts with Onus. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, so. so yeah, so this is where if the adapter persisted its state and all the adapter, you know, if, if whether it's one instance or an HA cluster one way or the other, the adapter comes back up, it has reloaded its knowledge of mm -hmm. what has been set up already and depending on that adapter it should then reach out to the hardware and get right. some sense of you know what is your state and if the state that it's in is in the same state the adapter remembers it being in then we're done nothing else needs to change from reconciliation's point of view mm. and i guess we'll also have to take care of the timing requirements i guess right during this process we cannot accept new flows installation or New configuration coming from northbound is is that? And I think of, that I would think that might be reflected as part of the state. Um, yeah, basic control the link state, right? Let the right. device or the offer state, you know, the release the the reins of offer state notification only when you're absolutely ready for somebody to tell you to do something different. Right. Well, but, but shouldn't, shouldn't so that, what is the danger if it, what, what is the danger if the adapter reboots or restarts or fails over or whatever it resyncs with the device and then faithfully faithfully reports up again minus the resources that are pond specific the flow the flow flows that onus is master of back to ono so if there is a difference between what what's controlled by onos from the physical device between the adapter it shouldn't be the adapter repushing back to the device it should be the adapter surfacing that to Onos to do the reconciliation. 
for flows, for certain things that Onos owns, the reconciliation should only happen in Onos, not in the adapter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so what would be wrong with the reconciliation being driven by Onos? I mean, so if if the adapter restarts, then basically it has nothing. So then Onos can just say, uh, you know, do you have this flow? And then, or, or, do, you, or do you understand? Can you get the state of this O and U, for instance, right? And then the O will team. I mean, the adapter, the the adapter needs to, right? The adapter has to synchronize or essentially recompose the the flows based on what it gets from the physical devices. And then when Onos asks it, it gives it that information. And then Onos reconciles. Well. Okay, so, but when, we, when we're reconciling, we only need to reconcile the ONU states, right? I mean, because the configure it once once the ONU is understood to be there, then ONOS knows what the state of that ONU should be. Yes. The unit. I'm, I'm and saying for those, those things ONOS owns, i.e., flows, non pons that pawn specific resources, only owners should reconcile. There shouldn't be an adapter device pseudo reconciliation. I guess, will, will this handle scenarios something like while well, the adapter was restarting and let's say the link on UNI port went down? So the flow is still there, but the link state is changed. And well, the result of that should be that owners should delete the flows. Well, so so the the adapter in that case presumably wouldn't have the flows, right? As soon as Onos gets the state of that ONU, then it determines what the you know the flow flow should be, right? So basically, adapter is deciding that the un the link went down, but the flow, basically the CV LAN and whatnot, is still there on ONU. And it should remove it just because the UNI link is down. Because when the link went down, that time adapter was not up. It was down or it was restarting, so it missed the notification of link going down. So you're saying yeah, Onos no. misses link down notification. Yeah, exactly. Happens? Yeah, yeah. Right. This is just one case, right? So there could be other notifications, autonomous notifications that could be missed when the adapter was restarting. <laughs> I mean, with OLT, it might be easier, but with ONUS, oh, sorry, with ONU, there could be such uh, several such possibilities. I mean, something like link going down while adapter was restarting. And, and until adapter synchronizes its MIP with ONU, it's not going to be able to pass this information to ONUS that while so I was took, restarting. Right. Right, but the yeah, thing the more. Conian approach here and said, look, when an adapter goes down, the device is flushed. And yes, while we don't have adapter HA, that's a problem and a service outage. But once we have adapter HA where we can't miss these events, right. then that will not be a service outage. And the issue is, just as you stated, because we cannot be sure what we missed when yeah. an adapter is down, we have to flush it. That's the more secure right. approach. Yeah, because if we try to handle case by case basis, it might become very complex. Right. I mean, in, in case of without HA and trying to cater to each of the missed notification. Uh, and also just related to this, I don't know if it's related or not. So there is also a comment that need to change core decomposition for trap flows to send to both parent and child. So let's say those trap flows are also sent to ONU adapter. So are we expecting those trap flows to be installed using OMCI on ONU? Yes. Yeah. So it would in that scenario, the trap flow um, after decomposition uh, would go to OLT adapter, OLT adapter would do all of the resource manager tech profile work, send yeah. a tech profile task to the ONU, but that tech profile task would not set up the VLAN on the ONU. 
the decomposer then at the same time would send a flow decomposed um, a flow to the ONU adapter directly. And depending on the timing, if that tech profile task isn't done yet, it will hold on to the ONU adapter, will hold on to that flow, right. and then when tech profile task is done, then push the VLAN onto the ONU via OCI. And so so is that VLAN going to be, let's say we are talking about EAPOL, so the rule is going to be that put this VLAN on EAPOL packets or just use this VLAN. Irrespective right, as of it is right now, OMCI right now, right now is not um, uh, doesn't dive any deeper into the packet. It is only a, a VLAN filtering mechanism. Right. So right, right now it's just yeah. So all we can do is basically say, tell me what traffic you want tagged with. It. Tell me that any zero VLAN tagged or untagged traffic will get to either VLAN tag 4091 implicitly or C tag. Or C -tag yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll ignore the classifier part, which means just EAPOL or DHCP. We won't care about that, okay. But I mean, the TP task um, in, in this case would still have been done as driven by the OLT adapter. It's just the TP task would no longer have the VLAN filter or EVTO um, uh, elements. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it, thanks. And need to do another time check because we're a half hour over and I need to get some time allocated to our next topic. Are we at a point where we can wrap up in a few minutes here for what we can accomplish on today's call? We may have to have some more discussion. Can we at least say we want say. decomposer to decompose the parent child flow for trap flows? I think that would that would answer the most pressing pieces of these at least. At least. Like they all have different routes. Like I wonder if they're actually. Sure. Let's yes, I, I think uh, that should be okay. <laughs> and okay, so because if we don't, we're making no progress three. after this hour and a half call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the flow replay part. Um, I just feel like for the sake of this, if if everyone else is keeping is being responsible for their own state, one way or the other. I don't see how it would hurt anything, um, and it may help things depending on what state the adapter you know, is or is not in. So, basically, that gear of replaying of bulk. Um, I don't see how it would hurt. Uh, does the open OLT support uh, bulk flow updates? As far they they just support incremental flow updates. It does, but I think it could be made to perform bulk. Um, that would just okay. have to be a, a task. Okay. So I think between those yeah, two, yeah, yeah. that gets us past. Yeah. I think most of the reboot, restart scenarios, you know, at least critically. Okay, the replay for we, for the uh, go ahead, Julie. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. No, the the replay for the ONU devices, uh, like chances are we are not talking about tons of flows, but for a replay on an OLT, that could be a lot of flows. It could be, yeah. And I think it's up to the adapter to do the right thing. Um, if it, if um, see, that's the thing is if if it. If it if it gets that bulk flow update and says everything I've told the device is exactly the same, that's the end of the conversation. It doesn't actually have to do anything with it. You're right. It's a lot of flows. Okay. That that could be a lot of flows. So should it be more like instead of uh, the core to markedly replay, uh, for either the core to check what flows the adapter have, and then push. The, ch the difference yeah. or the adapter coming back says here's the flows that I have and force well, a refresh. So the, I mean, the only problem with that is that Onos is now out of sync with what's happening yeah. in the physical world, right? Yeah. The Onos really needs to go and audit its, you know, the, the, the ONUs it knows about, it needs to audit that state. Okay, so how about this? We don't re-push the flows then. We just say until something 
explicitly says something's changed, assume everything is exactly as you've last been told, which basically says right. don't repush. And and this is in the non HA situation, right? So this yeah. was, this is a, a an adapter that went down. There's no backup, and so so the system is completely out of sync with the physical OT at that point. The physical OT is presumably fine at that point. Now the, there's a restart on the adapter, and then it seems like Onos needs to be the one that that then goes and tries to reconcile the ONU state. Yeah. And then and then and then flow addition withdrawal occurs based on what ONOS discovers. Okay, so, you know, trying to be respectful of time. So, yes to decomposer for trap parent and child, no for autonomous repushing. And I think if we do the former, it may remove the need for the latter. But we'll, we'll let's see how that plays out. Okay, so no replay flows in any state change on a device. From the, automatically Correct. from the core. Correct. Yep. Let's let's at least draw that line in the sand now, and then as, if a specific scenario comes up like the mismatch VLANs, and we can address it maybe in another way. Okay. So for now, let's leave it. Cool. Well, it's let's make the decision then. <laughs> Is the wording that I have here sufficient for that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. And Mahir, thanks for your patience as well. Let's go ahead and move on to the second topic. And then, Ken, if we need to schedule more time on another call, please let me know so we can get this back on the agenda for follow-up. Uh, yeah, I'm, going to, then, I'm going to just update the document uh, we'll, okay. uh, and, and send it out. Uh, and if anybody have any uh, concerns, comments, then they can reply on what I discuss. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Mahir, I'm bringing up the email discussion. I don't know if you want me to just have this here or if there's anything you'd like to share from your screen, just let me know. Uh, no, I don't have anything to share. Okay. okay, I'll hand it over to you now. Okay. Uh, let's start again. It's first item, uh, it was about the response of the GET device. Uh, message and to a, for a quick recap again. So we we had a voter device structure. It, uh, it was a huge structure and it's it sent a response to the get device, but the adapters needed very few uh, fields of this voter device uh, when they query the device. So the the discussion was about to. Uh, minimize the response of this get device uh, message uh, to reduce the size on the Kafka. Uh, so I think everybody uh, is on the, I mean, everybody uh, think that we, we, we should uh, minimize the response size, but we are not uh, on the same page how to do that. So that, that there are, I mean, I think we, we talked about three ways to do the, that. First is to uh, define a new structure and send it as a response to the get device. The second was let it let get device stay there. We did this response and define another message uh, instead of get device and send the minimized structure to the response of that. And the third was, was dividing get device to a few messages like get device status, get device proxy address, etc. So I think uh, this was all we discussed though. I don't know if there was anything else. So uh, on this point, I propose to to open a, uh, a Jira task uh, to say that we have to minimize the response of the dead device, and the owner of the task, or I, I can do it. Uh, we can check the all ONU adapter and OLT adapter, and check. You can check all get device requests and which information is needed or used. 
as a response of this get device request. And with this full list, we can decide to take a proper, pro, uh, proper action. Is that okay for everyone? I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, if, uh, basically, what you're saying that uh, you're going to look at the at, at the most common messages and then uh, come up with uh, a proposal to, of the messages that we we need to add to the APIs, or if there's another way to uh, maybe if we do a, a get device with uh, with some filters uh, mm -hmm. as part of the parameter. So yes. the, the only question is. is you know, when we were discussing this before, it seemed like there were some attributes of the device that were non-config changeable, right? It's so like the serial number of an ONU. So uh, it seems like that would be, if you just, if you need the serial number of an ONU to report an alarm, for instance, it seems like you really don't need to go to the core for that because the adapter knows what that is. It's the source of truth for that particular value. So can we can we look at removing requests to get stuff that the you know the core really doesn't own? Yeah, I yeah. think there are scenarios where the adapters probably ask the core more often than it really should at all. Um, there, we probably really need to kind of go through and audit that just because it's kind of just carry over from migration. Um, because in that scenario, yes, it absolutely knows the serial number, the uni ports, and all the IDs it needs from a you know an initial setup and at least getting device once to to do all that without having to ask the core for anything. Yes, yeah, so so we can go uh, one by one on each get device uh, and decide what 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 should we do with that? Uh, we, should we remove get device, this get device, or should we change its and and especially what is needed for this query so question is it possible um and this may be more of a grpc question to have the the rpc forget device at least you know named stay the same but then have a new argument that says um you know filter and then provide some sort of you know list of elements for the device proto that you want back and then if you don't provide that filter, the default behaviors do what you've always done, which is return everything. Is that doable? Yes, but yeah. this time you should, you should insert a lot of fields for for putting from filters, I think. I, I, I think like it's it's doable. The only thing is like uh, the, we'll need to add a, a filter param to it and the filter param can be nil. And, but I think for, all that uh, typically that uh, what we are looking for is uh, the device state. That's typically what uh, the adapters uh, needs, and uh, maybe some other params from it. But typically for those requests, if if we want to make that a, a get device as small as possible, one of the filter that could be would be things like uh, no flows, like uh, don't give me any flows, and no configs. For example, there won't be any PM config, there won't be any event config. It will just be the minimum set of device. Or we could just have a like a, a flag says, give me the minimum set of device of, of information, which typically would be maybe the IDs and, and the status. Right, but again, how much of that could be handled, handled by the depth that we already have in gRPC, right? Um, uh, you know. But the def is like it, it, it treats the, the object as a right. as a tree structure, and uh, yes. at this time there's a lot of thing at the high level, right, uh, of of a device. But the flows aren't. If we're just going to drop out the flows, that's a second level, right? So you actually uh, do remove a lot by just love using that the existing tree state tree level. The flows is uh, is at. Uh, you get a reference to the flow, but it will just be empty inside. Yes. And uh, and uh, what else? Like uh, I can't remember the structure of the <laughs> of the of the device, but uh, there's a lot of thing that is at the high level, though at at the first level. 
Okay. Just getting rid of slows and PM config would 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 go a long way. I think yep. those are the worst offenders. But 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 I think it's worth also to look at uh, at the depth of the RPC because if we could if it's something that could be used and it would be as generic as possible. Yeah, yeah. If we can apply a filter and then basically it's smart enough to filter as much or as little as you want without having a whole lot of custom code, then that'd be ideal. Yeah. You know, for the sake of progress, really flows and PM configs, I think, would be the a good starting point for exclusion. And ports. I think ports are getting a second level. So yes. if you if you like say yeah. just give me one level, you're really just getting that top of that tree. And as uh, Ken said, you're going to get empty things for the port list, the flow list, all that stuff. But again, that will drastically reduce the, the level of data you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 looking at the at the device uh, proto, I think uh, going with the level will work because. Uh, Maybe I maybe I can share my screen like uh, sure. Maybe this, Let me. This way. I'll give you presentation rights. And while we're changing presenters, just a reminder to everyone that we're extending the meeting by thirty minutes, so we still have some good discussion time. And we can see your screen, Ken. Okay, so this is the device structure uh, that we have. So when we are talking about first level, we are talking about the ID, the type, the root, the current ID, the vendor model hardware, uh, the images at second level, serial number, vendor, adapter, it will have the VLAN, uh, proxy address, that would be second, well, not used later, it's, uh, it will be second level, um, state will be there, admin operation state, the reason field will be there, connection state will be there. I think custom, I don't think uh, there's much use of custom at this time. Ports won't be there, flows won't be there, flow groups won't be there, PM config won't be there, and image download won't be there. So it'd be a, a really minimum set of, uh, of what we're expecting in the device. That might be enough, and if we can use level, yeah. then we're using existing mechanism. Exactly, and uh, it's uh, the the only problem with that is uh, if we want to have, uh, if we say level two, for example, right? Now we're getting everything. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Or we, we, or we could have level and a field, an additional filter with that. Although, I, I, why don't we stick with level? And if we need the additional filter, add it as opposed to, you know, uh, prematurely optimize. So, uh, I would, so I would uh, agree with that. It's the, the only thing is like uh, when we, it will be kind of. We already that either we get minimum set of data or everything, and and is that sufficient, or is that too much data? Well, course, well we'll I, guess, I guess what kind of access are people requesting? I guess I mean we, we want to basically have a minimal access, and then if there's any, is this like an intermediate access or? or on everything access. I mean, it seems like it's minimal or everything right now, right? With level, that's it's what that would be, but that's what I'm saying. Do we have a use case where intermediate is needed? Um, yeah, I'm looking now. And one thing that could be done There's for anything that intermediate are... to have a specific, uh, uh, sorry guys. Yeah, yeah, I keep thinking ports and proxy might be two that might might come up. Um, 
I'm looking for specific examples, but those two get used a bit more. Uh, but for those, Matt, uh, I believe we already have APIs for those, right? Get points, APIs. Oh, that's right, we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it could be that uh, maybe the going with uh, with the level uh, just to get the basic uh, minimum and, and anything else, we just have specific, specific APIs to make those requests. I think we can start with that. I think that's, let's, let's start with that and then see, see how we improve. I mean, here, what do you think? Yeah, yeah it makes sense. Really. Uh, we can start with that. Okay. It may be two level of filtering or three level of filtering, but two level is okay for now. I think, I mean, keeping these flows and PM configs and ports out of the picture may, I mean, may work. So another decision point uh, today. <laughs> We should end the Last meeting right here. <laughs> <laughs> so two levels are okay for us now, and we will put a filter to get device message, and according to this filter, we will return a minimal set of the data or whole well, device data. It's not, it's not a filter. It's it's a it's using the level argument in GRPC. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And just level argument alone is enough to exclude flows in PM, which, again, I think goes a long way. It's just, does it take too much is probably the question, but we can, we can start with it. Um, yeah, it, it, it also needs to be implemented because it's, uh, even if GRPC supports it, uh, I, I, I I don't think uh, we can just leave it like that. The, the code needs support it as well. I'm probably, I'm probably given our previous discussion. It might, it'd be interesting to see what places would need a level two access. It's probably none, I would assume, but maybe there are. It might be good to look at those. Um. Ken, I'm not sure how much we have to actually implement here because I, I ran into this when I was dealing with the um, volt cuddle, right, where I was querying a device and not getting flows because the level defaulted like to zero or one or whatever. So it may be that gRPC handles this for us with that with that level set. Um, it just doesn't encode. It doesn't. Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, just doesn't encode. Um, when it's encoding the, the structure, it just doesn't encode the, those bits. So I'm not sure we have to do anything. Oh, it's actually, a test I, oh, actu oh, actually, I think that won't work. Now we are, we are blurring. It's we're talking about uh, not GRPC car. We are talking about car over Kafka. Oh, from the adapters. Yeah, there's a. <laughs> And uh, so we're back to a filter <laughs> argument for the Kafka interface yeah. into Proto. Yeah. Yeah. So the question then is when we're encoding this in Protobuf, is there a field for the Protobuf that basically says encode which levels and then we can just mimic what's happening in gRPC? Fields uh, in the Protobuf. Uh... I'm encoding the data structure into protobuf. Is there a argument to that um, encoding that basically gives says only you know how deep to go? I think we need to look at that. Because then we can essentially mimic. Yeah. We then we mimic the behavior, and then mm -hmm. we have some consistency. And then if we ever choose to remove one and go with Kafka everywhere or gRPC everywhere, we have at least consistency at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. It'll just have to be done in both the Go and the Python um, interfaces. Yeah, yeah the, the, the hope would be, the hope would be that, you know, 
the encoding algorithm in the protobuf um, has some level, has an ability to say, hey, only encode this level of the structure. And I'm hoping it's there because then gRPC would use it. I mean, that would be logical, but it's not guaranteed it's there. Yeah, briefly looking through the code, just most of the, the get devices, at least on the ONU side, are in and around dealing with um, reason. Yes. Or right. checking for reason, updating reason. So um, for the purposes of, again, level one, that would cut out quite a bit for most of the calls. But are there any of those calls that I guess only ask for um, state information that the adapter is responsible for, like the serial number or the upper state? I mean, can they be just cut out completely in that case? I remember that I saw something that's asking serial number and asking proxy address from the core. Those, I think, are fewer, right? There should just be one or two initially. Um, I'm looking at some connection status, if checking if connection status is reachable. Um, I have to figure out if there's a better way of doing that. Connection status, I can't, this is, gets back to connection status versus off status. You know, when, when we use one or the other, and we've been kind of like, you know, loose about when we use one or the other. Some of the port and device state updates may, as a byproduct, help some of this as well. Yeah, I guess we can just see where it all falls out and then try and optimize later, I guess. Yeah, I think taking it incrementally is a good idea. We'll, we'll you know, come up, like David said, come up with some way of a Kafka-ified version of the level so that it works well with everybody with with Go and Python. Try that with the uh, the bulk of the calls being the the, the reason updating and setting, and then just kind of see what the performance looks like afterwards. And then from there, decide is it worth you know keeping, you know, going any further with it. That's unreasonable. My idea is good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> on to the next. <laughs> All right, are we finally to number three, the one that we've been putting off for like two weeks now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think so. So let me, oh, I thought I had that up here. I guess I don't. Let me open that up. Uh, this one is, I mean, not, not directly about this task, but I put, I mean, some logs to this task, maybe I might read something wrong in the log, but uh, I think this is uh, certain that uh, uh, more than one thread uh, waits for mm -hmm. the, waits on the same log for the same device at the same time. Uh, so I think I think this is a, a problem uh, to uh, misorder the uh, messages coming from the Kafka. Uh, so the, the, my my proposal is uh, changing this locking mechanism with something like channel or queuing per device, so we can be sure that the the processed. Uh, all of the messages coming for a device in in their order. Uh, that, that's the uh, discussion. So the, there's my here. I look at the logs and there's a 
couple of things. I think uh, one of the items that needs to be kind of tackled first is uh, uh, when we are talking about a transaction, at least today, uh, when we talk about a transaction, when, when we get a transaction in a call, uh, we call the transaction as a transaction being complete. The moment we send it over Kafka, we send it to the adapter and the adapter send back an act. At that moment, the call says, okay, for me, that from, from what I'm concerned, that transaction has been processed in the call. Like uh, there's a separate discussion about uh, when the transaction should actually be done, and uh, we started that, and then we got sidetracked with other things. But but as of today, uh, when the when the call send a request to an adapter, the adapter needs to send back an act right away, and then process the request. And what I've noticed in the open or new adapter. And I think the open OLT also to some extent for certain messages, instead of sending an act back right away, it went and process uh, the message and then send a response back. By doing that, that hold the lock uh, for that request in the call uh, much longer than it should be to such a way that subsequent request that is coming in at times if, for example if the call send a, a request on a certain device to the when you adapter instead of the when you adapter reply back what it does it does some other it process certain things and then send a request to the call on the same device and now potentially causing a lock there yeah, a locking mechanism that's why we want the when you adapter to send an act right away to free up that device so that that is one of the reasons why you're seeing uh, multiple requests waiting for the same device. Uh, the the second thing is in 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 the call when we get a request, we get requests both from southbound and northbound. Uh, it, it can be on the same device. So my question to you is like when you're talking about ordering of request. Uh, how critical it is for a request to be ordered uh, when coming into the call? Like what kind of request do we have that ordering is so important when it comes to the call? I'm not talking about OMCI because OMCI is between the adapters, but the one going into the call. Um, the, the, during the bring up, I mean, when, when, when ONU brings up and uh, the owner discover indication came to OLT adapter and everything started. Then you, there are I mean, some tasks running uh, simultaneously on core and OLT adapter and ONU adapter about a device. So because after uh, Core received the message about the device, for example, charge device detected. Then it sends a message to ONU adapter and another one to OLT adapter. Then they start to do something else about the device and they send some messages back to Core to change the device status or update the device. And these are mostly done parallel. Uh, so when these different messages uh, re uh, received by core from ONU adapter or OLT adapter, then there is no mechanism to put them in order. You received, as a core, you received two uh, status updates, two updates, one from ONU adapter and one from OLT adapter, for example. Uh, then you don't have a chance to order them and uh, execute the first one, then the second one. So okay. if your transition was uh, transiting state from A to B, then B to C, because of this locking mechanism uh, and unordering, you can end up with uh, transiting from A to C and C to B. I understand that, but if, if we look at, uh, if you're getting parallel requests, 
from two adapters, those requests itself are not ordered because they can be in any order, right? Yeah. So if, if we have a system that is forced to order things, and if there's a requirement for that, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll have to do that. But the problem with, uh, with ordering events, and, and for example, when, you, when you're mentioning about, uh, about changing the, the locking mechanism to use channels, uh, basically like today, what happened is those messages, first, in order to have pure ordering, we need to have ordering from the source. In this case, we don't even have it. So we have messages that are being sent on Kafka. And, and to have a pure ordering, we need to be able to take the first message, take it out, figure out to what device it is, and then take that and then put that on the device queue, for example. Let's say we have a queue. Mm -hmm. We send that on the queue. And then only after then, we go and take the next message. And, and, and says, oh, for which, uh, what is this device? And then we send it to there. If we, if we go with that, things would be slowing down quite a bit because basically today we, had to, we, we go for a process of and marshalling of the data because at first we don't know what it is. So we'll, we'll have a, a single routine that is listening on Kafka, take the first message, processing the entire and marshalling of it, figure out what it is and, it's, and then send it out. Like um, I believe that that will slow down things. Uh, the other thing about um, when you're mentioning about using a channels uh, in terms of locking mechanism uh, since we're primarily processing requests and making states uh, mutex is um, is simpler in, in it and the, one of the big advantage of mutex is for example if you have a lot of read that is happening read requests that is happening we can p process all of them in parallel because we have a read lock on them so all can be read at the same time uh, but if you have a go uh, go channel for that they will have to be sequential uh, uh, because of that so there's this pros and cons of uh, of uh, of channels but but to come to the first point about uh, ordering uh, do we actually need that ordering to start with See, are, are channels about ordering or about really just a different mechanism for locking here. It's basically saying the I, I think both, messages for both can, can, okay. Um, Cause I always thought it was look, well, if we put things in a queue, a channel, then we can have multiple people and, and the issue isn't um, ordering. Then you could have multiple routines read from that channel and do a lot of concurrent processing on events, whether they're read writes or whatever. Um, uh, if you have, it only matters if within that channel you need uh, singular access to the data for each event. If you have the queues or channels per device, then I think you you have the order. Also, you you guarantee to to access the data. Uh, I mean, each time, uh, one time, um, for each message, no, 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 no other threat will, uh, yeah. will, will go to access your data at the same time. Right. That that does have the disadvantage that Ken just referred to is you sequenced both read and read write operations on that same channel, and. If you don't do that, you're going to end up using mutexes underneath and say, look, well, if I have a read-only channel for device X and a read-write channel for device X, you're still going to be using read locks and write locks underneath. I don't, I, I'm not sure if we uh, need the reads or read-writes to separate, like, because and sometimes if you get, I, I saw this, it's a case that I mean, for reason update, I mean, getting update and setting it uh, in different times and 
we assume that we have the, the we get the device update some state change done, but because this this update state threads were waiting for log, we got the the message earlier than we we we, we requested. So this also I mean, I don't know how it is. Is it good to get message before all updates or not? It sometimes may need to be waited after some updates are done. How would yeah. using channels affect the current use case we're talking about where the core sends a Kafka event, locks and sends a Kafka event and is waiting for an act back? How would that affect this? Would that, would that still have that same waiting for an act back before I release and get the read from the channel again? I mean, if the messages from uh, sources send it in a, uh, how, how can I say, in an order, uh, then if we, we know that they can come from an order, then uh, by by preserving the order in core, uh, guaranteed that uh, we will do the job in in correct order. I think. I mean, uh, right. But I thought the current use case was the core hand gets a call, whether that comes from a channel or from an API call, doesn't really matter. It's got a a bit of work. Okay. That bit of work it's doing is sending a Kafka message to the adapter and then waiting for an acknowledgement from that adapter that it got the event before continuing on. on. Now, if in the can, current uh, implementation, I that think, grabs a mutex, makes a Kafka call, puts a message on the bus, and waits for an ACK, and then releases a mutex. In a I channel think, situation, it would read from the channel, send a Kafka message, wait for the uh, ACK, and then read from the channel again. So wouldn't we have the same problem in this use case? I think waiting mutex for Kafka messages is also a problem. I mean, if you use the mutex for 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 saving the transaction to the database or or cache, then keeping mutex for for sending the message on Kafka and waiting it as a response is another problem from my point of view. Because you don't know how long will it take to to get the response of this Kafka message, it may be wait for timeout for second. So if you yep. keep this mutex, I mean, it may cause some problems also. Because you, you, yeah. you, you're, not, you're not only in a process and there are some other processes different than core and they are doing, they are doing something. So yep. be, be, because of that, I think, and in code, I, I don't see any, this kind of behaviors other than the one in this that uh, task. So there is, as I saw, there is only one place that we wait on the lock during the Kafka messaging. And for Ken, me, what is the what is the point? Yeah, what is the point of a, of the the keeping the mutex over the Kafka call? What what are we what is it trying to accomplish? Yeah, what it tries to accomplish is. Um, Assume we don't uh, hold a mutex, right? So pretty much what it means, because currently there's no act, if, if there's no transaction completion and notification coming back from an adapter. So if we remove that lock, uh, meaning the call no longer waits, uh, it sends a, trans a, a request on Kafka and forgets it. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, we we'll reply back to the no found and says, okay, we're done. But we don't know if the adapter is actually processing it or not. Right, right. But even so, so even if you just wait for the act, right, saying that the, you know, someone's received that message, it doesn't mean it's complete. So yeah, I guess it's like, what, it, what, why? Complete. I mean, Kafka messages get response immediately when you send them. Kafka message to an adapter, the first thing the adapter does is sending an OK message back and then dealing with that's, the, yeah, that's mean, not the case. It, it for seems, like, it seems like we don't care. I mean, it seems like we don't really care, right? Because the, we don't, 
I mean, Kafka's keeping track of whether a message has been delivered or not. Presumably there's going to be an error if it's, if it is not. Um, so do, do we even care whether it, the act comes back? I mean, why, why block at all? No, we, because well, was... when we define, when we define the transaction in this model, in the current model, we say transaction will be done after an adapter receive it. So if we, if we want to change that model to say, and the transaction is done uh, when Kafka receive it, that's fine too. Then we need to change, uh, uh, stop the lock earlier than than before. It's just so, so, it's just how we want to define the transaction. Right. So so if if we say the transaction is complete only when it's implemented in the hardware, then we have to wait. Right. There's not there's no other option. Exactly. That's that's why earlier I was referring that we had the transaction discussion. We started that and then we got sidetracked and we have not. Uh, so so what 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 we're doing really is. Let me back up. If we say, look, once the uh, core sends the Kafka message, it then release, be, it doesn't wait for an act. The acknowledgement back to the northbound API is that essentially we've received the call and we've pushed our job, we've pushed it forward. There's at some point in the future, there's a promise that it likely will get implemented by an adapter, but there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. So all we're doing is acknowledging that the job was accepted. That's all we're doing, correct. If we want um, to change that model, that's fine too. If we want, well, I that's, I agree. If we, you know, then if we want guaranteed messaging between the adapter, the core and the adapter, that's up to a Kafka configuration because it can Kafka can do persistence and guaranteed messaging if we wanted to do it, and. That means if there's a, a restart of the adapter, the you know the message will get replayed to the adapter, um, and we're you know we guarantee the adapter actually eventually does get the message. There's still the issue actually, is that the adapter actually, could get no, the actually, message and then crash and it's still not processed, but that's a different issue. Yeah, so the replay of of the adapter, like if the adapter crashes, it doesn't really happen because the adapter will have um, to go for a reconciliation process first. So I, I'm kind of of the opinion right now that we just the core doesn't fire and forget. I'm okay with that. Uh, the if we're okay with that, that's that's a simple thing. So we need to change uh, some locks around. Should also the when a adapter sends a request to the core, for example, to update a device state. Should the core get the request and says, okay, I'm good with it? Or should it uh, process that request and send and then send a response to the adapter? Uh, in second case, uh, I think there may be some problems because not for update steps, but for like something like uh, child device detected or some other messages. If you wait to to core, for example, do its job and then respond, uh, in some cases, core again send an, um, another message to the to another adapter, and yeah, yeah. In it, it, case, it, oh. if it wait the response of this message, then you may have. I mean, yeah, yeah. The, those one obviously but, like uh, we can't like we can't lock, yeah. lock, Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Those one something. obvious. Yeah. Those one obviously we won't be able to wait. But I'm talking about the most common messages, okay. like update reason, update status. Mm. And do we want the core to comp because uh, one way to guarantee uh, ordering indirectly, at least from the same adapter, the same adapter sending the same set of messages. Typically, if you are sending like update status followed by update reason, let's say. Mm -hmm for argument's sake, then if the core reply back only after completion of that action, then you will have ordering there. See what I mean? Yeah, then maybe for, for some messages, as you said, it may be, I don't know. 
he should think a bit on it if there are some I, calls for it. Yeah, I worry about when we say some messages because I hate <laughs> kind of saying not treating everything. <laughs> not everything is equal. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Yeah, we would hope so, but it's uh, the message is all different. Uh, they have different, uh, like Mahir was saying, like if you get a child device de detected, uh, the processing of that is way different than from a, for example, a point creation message. Yeah, if we, if we start making sec uh, exceptions, it's going to lead down a bad path, I fear. Yeah, you know, it's and and because some messages like uh, requires a response, like for example, like get get device reason or get device status. There's a reason, so those ones there's, there's no there's there's an expectation of a response on those requests. So in a way, they are kind of synchronous indirectly. So those are, the call will have to to get the data and send it back. But for messages that have the option of being fully sync. Where we get it and and we process it in the background, there's a likelihood that we'll get another message coming back uh, within a few milliseconds later that potentially can be processed. Well, how, how 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 long do you wait for a response? Is there a timeout or? Yeah, there there are timeouts that are set. Okay. It's configurable timeouts. Like uh, if 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 we go with uh, we saying the, the call send a message uh, to the to the adapter and it fires it to Kafka and forgets it, then maybe we need to follow the same approach where the adapter when it send a message to the call uh, other than messages that it absolutely requires a response right away, it can just send it to Kafka and forget it. If you yeah. want to have similar kind of consistency. Uh, so Ken, let's say we send a message to Kafka and forget it. Uh, and let's say there is a subsequent operation that was dependent on the result of the previous operation. Would how would that happen? I mean, would the would the messages be serialized on the receiver side? Uh, like, uh, for example, the course and message A on Kafka and then followed by message B on Kafka. Right, right. Right. Assuming, let's say, uh, just for the sake of discussion, so let's say prior message was set state to active, right? Submits, the sender submits it to Kafka, assumes it's done, moves on mm -hmm. to the next step, which is performed on the assumption that the state has already been set active because I received an ACK or, or whatever or the message was transmitted, but in reality, the state may not be active, right? Mm -hmm. So then it would end up sending the next message, which should have been sent only after the state was active. But then both messages, they reach at the receiver, so are would they be processed in order, as in setting active first and then the subsequent message, or is the order undetermined? <laughs> There is a slight chance that the the message can be the second message can be done before the first message mm -hmm. if we but, just but, uh, but send if, it on Kafka and forget. If there's an ordering issue again, sending on Kafka and forgetting is different than still saying I'm going to acknowledge a message. It's just that I'm not going not going to acknowledge it in a lock and keep data locked. I can say, go set this value. Right, and then fire and forget. And but if I care about the response, or I care that that was actually done, I can still say, look, I'm not going to send my second message until I still get my acknowledgement back. I'm a state machine, right? I'm waiting for that next transition, which says, oh, he just acknowledged he set the state. Now I can send my next message. So there's still that capability. I think we want. I think the issue is I'm not, I'm not in a wait state withholding a lock until that happens. I'm gonna fire the event, and now I'm gonna go on and do something else. When I get a state transition back that that event was actually processed, I may actually send another event. Mm -hmm. So basically so it I, depends on the caller. 
Right. Whether it, okay. Uh, meaning, uh, in the case where you're saying perform, uh, like set the, the state to A, if you need mm -hmm. to wait for it, what it means for those transactions, for example, you send that to the code, when the code get that message, it needs to process it fully and then send you back the response. So you have, in a way, indirectly, you have to wait for it. Yeah, you see, if you care about the response, you'll wait for the response. But again, and, you're and not holding a lock while you do that, I think. Or, or you could just go get the state again. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what you absolutely. Wait for the <laughs> yep. That's uh, in many systems. That's the way it works. It's uh, because you you don't know if it has actually been changed or not. So is the net result of this issue where um, we have, let's say, a couple hundred O and U devices, and they're all in various operation states? discovered active you know when in reality they all should be active i don't follow the question matt yes no, no, so i think so I, so I, I, the scenario is let's say we're activating 100 o and u's and for whatever reason one or two or five of them even though they are let's say in the reason field progressed obviously beyond um, active, yes. right? They're active and then some, but their their uh, offer status or their you know current connect status, either one, still says discovered, but then it's already progressed further down the path that can only happen if it is active. But it's saying it's discovered. It's like the the, the messages were delivered out of order. The active came first, and then the discovered came. Is that yes. the scenario we're seeing? Yes, that, that uh, that's what I saw in my past, and that's the scenario. So we have a device is saying they're discovered when they're really active and possibly the other way around. Yeah. So, so which yeah, means I, that, mm -hmm, in, go ahead. In, in my test with a few hundreds of ONUs, um, I saw that some ONUs uh, remain in different uh, active statuses, uh, sorry, operation statuses, or some confused uh, reasons. But when, when checking their, I mean, logs, etc., I, I thought that they might, they should be on another state, because, for example, some of the ONUs continue to do their OMCI messaging and they finalize it. They send all crates and sets, etc., but they're still in discovered state. They should be in active state or activating state, etc. But they are still in discovered state, and that, that's the case for some, sometimes for reason also. Uh, so checking the logs, I saw that there, there are these state updates and other updates are waiting on the on the lock on the same time. So they two or three, sometimes four threads are waiting for the lock at the same time. And then sometimes core give the uh, give the, the luck to the to the state updates uh, came later. So then then the states are confused. So this is my reading from the logs. I mean, perhaps it may be I, I might read something read something wrong. But that's that was my reading reading from the logs. So is there a mechanism in the APIs when we say update device state to let's say, you know, discovered or active um, that we can at least, you know, query or pull or wait or, or have some way of knowing that it's actually done before proceeding? Like if we fire and forget and then we proceed to our next fire and forget, you know, that seems like what the scenario we're in right now, but it seems like we need to, at least on the adapter side, fire off an update and do not proceed until we know we're ready to move on to the next state. Is there any way of determining that, or is that something okay, we're just so not doing in the API properly? Maybe uh, there, there are a couple couple of things. 
if we go with uh, with we saying okay a transaction is uh, when we we send it on Kafka and we're going to forget forget about it. Uh, there is uh, in the APIs in the Kafka APIs today we have we have an option where we can say I'm waiting for a response or I'm not waiting for a response. Uh, it's 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 a boolean. Uh, if you're saying you're waiting for the res a response for that means uh, uh, when you send it out, uh, Kafka that is that library will wait for a response coming back from Kafka on that. Uh, when you say when that update goes into the core, the core currently what it does it uh, it starts a different routine and says okay go and do that and 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 today's uh, send back an act for example in the case of an uh, update devices okay I got it. Uh, if we want to get the the full response saying that it's completed then instead of the core fire a separate uh, uh, well it could still fire a separate go routine but what it will do instead of a send of uh, sending an act back it will send an act with the result of that update uh, status in the core and then uh, on the on the adapter side you will actually wait until until you get it So this API exists. Is that did that? Is that what you meant? Yeah, the API is okay. the API works. The, 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 the yes, synchronous yes. API also. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if we said it like uh, I don't want to wait for anything, then it would be a. Uh, I think you set the flag to false. I Means uh, we just send it on Kafka and forget it. If you say you want to wait, then you set it to true, and and I, and I believe almost everything is set to true. And then it get to the core. And then uh, today, the core for most uh, transactions, it sends an act back, and then uh, and process it. Uh, for cases where, if there are some API, what which we believe, like we really want to have uh, the transaction complete fully in the core, then we'll we'll have to identify those and get them to completion before sending back a response to. Uh, to to the adapter. You do you mean, for example, in status update case, mm -hmm. you will wait until the status update done, or I mean, if you want the response, will it yeah. be sent back when the re message is received or when the status is updated after? Like we can change it uh, either way, but. Uh, if if the adapter really needs uh, that uh, the that this state has been reflected in the core fully, then it will have to be done after uh, that change has been completed in the core. That response will come back after it's completed fully. Maybe we can have different APIs, kind of like because if we start to use this everywhere, then it's going to incur a performance penalty. Yeah, but that's why I'm, I'm I'm saying like in only for those APIs that we believe that uh, the adapter will absolutely need a, a a response showing completion of it. But but the completion can mean something different depending on the person who implements it, right? I mean, if 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 somebody wants to make a state change, then um, to be sure that the state change actually happen, you'd probably have to go read the state from wherever you're changing it, right? I mean, would, would uh, that be a safer way? If you really, if you really want <laughs> to make sure something happened, you could just go do a get uh, on the thing you're yes, changing, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, there's two aspects of that. It's like, uh, yes, for, for whoever needs that data, they do another get, uh, for sure, they will need to do, maybe, maybe they will have to do several, several gets. To, to get to the latest, uh, to the state that they need. Uh, but then that increased the number of messages on Kafka, that uh, increased the number of requests on the core. And uh, the other option is like for the core, when it's complete the request is pretty much what it means is that status has been reflected in the model uh, that is persistent. And then sent back a response uh, to the ad adapter. Means the next request you're guaranteed 
uh, will be dealing with that state. Right, but that, that could be, I and mean, there could be several steps in that process, right? So the, the state mm -hmm. in the, you know, the, the um, device could be changed, but, um, you know, if, if I wait until it's reflected in the SCD database, that could be quite a long time. Could be, but uh, it's uh, but uh, if that state change, uh, potentially if there's another state state that got changed, it will go, it will follow the same path, right? Right, but yeah. everything's held up on updating the SED database, right? In that case, that example. Yeah, it's a, like like I said, it all depends like what we wanted the transaction right. to be. Right, so it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all yeah, down to that. Yeah, essentially, that would mean that the receiver has triggered the op specified operation, but there is no guarantee if that got completed or not. Yeah. Well, if it didn't, there should be some kind of error, I assume, right? I mean... Yeah, and that error will need to be populated back to the adapter. Right, but so, I mean, the only, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the only way the adapter would know is if it goes and requests state again, I guess. But. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I know we are way past your time, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to do, do a time check. I have a few more minutes. I can hang on, though. <laughs> yeah. So, do we want to have, uh, like, a, um, since today we're making a lot of decisions, <laughs> do we want to say, okay, we're going to remove all the locks and uh, at least from the core perspective, we are going to send uh, any requests that we send and to Kafka, it will be fine for get. Or do we want to have it as part of a bigger transaction, this discussion, and, uh, and then make those changes after? Yeah, I, my, my preference would be have a bigger transaction discussion and just have an agreement on how we want the system to behave. Any other comments? Yeah, I think I agree that the transaction might solve, address these issues also. Makes sense to me too. Okay, then uh, let's, uh, let's do that then. <laughs> we'll have another long discussion <laughs> later on. <laughs> and then, what do you think timing wise would be good for that? Do you think we'd be able to have enough discussion material ready for next Thursday? I think so. Okay. Leave. Okay, let's. Let's target next Thursday for that then. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this one flagged with the all discuss for now, since this will be part of that larger discussion, I think as well. Um, and then let's see, anything else we need to circle back to for today? That really flag On this flag. last topic, because that's the only one we still have people here for. I'm sorry. The boolean flag for the the Boolean flag that Ken mentioned, I'd, I'd really like to know, make sure we understand. It looks like the, setting the reply topic implies this, but I could be misreading it. So maybe just a, a, a quick corner at where this is in the either the Python, well, and Python and Go libraries to guarantee this uh, response. Yeah, if you, if you look at the, um, if you look at the core proxy, uh, from the adapter perspective, I, I believe you'll see that. I, I can send you the uh, a bit more information on that, Matt. Yeah, I think it would be good because I, I feel like if we're using the API wrong, that might answer some of this as well. Yeah, but as of today, like for example, like uh, if we keep the today's model where we need an ACK coming back from the adapter, uh, it's not implemented by all uh, for all APIs. Definitely in the open or when you, it's not implemented for all messages. Uh, not the Python libraries then? 
uh, not the Python, the the uh, no, 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 the Python, Python version. Well, and I guess that's getting to the question because right now the call that we typically make is like, you know, cool proxy device update passing a device, right? And then mm -hmm. are we supposed to take a response and then you know pull on it, or I, I, I guess I'm missing something about that update device call that guarantees completion. You know, if there's something we need to pass differently or not. Okay, there are two aspects of it. It's a, it's one whether we are, because currently we are, if you say I'm, I'm waiting, means you're waiting for that act coming from the call. If you say you're not waiting, you're, it's just like pushing on Kafka and forget it. Uh, but the act coming from the call currently is just the call getting it and sending back a ca an act and then updating the data. And uh, the question is more about, uh, do we want the call to complete that transaction and then send the app back. Confusing? Well, I just want to make sure because the, the, the front door to the API as it is right now is pretty simple. And I'm trying to dig through core proxy and see it somewhere between, you know, invoke and then the actual Kafka proxy itself. Is there something that additional is needed? It looks like the reply topic is, is what drives it, which, you know is it, i think it's being set all the time anyway so i may just be missing exactly yeah. yeah that's why i'm saying it's by default it's set to true it means uh wait okay so really just we need to possibly redefine what wait means is what it exactly comes down to. yeah mm -hmm. got it okay okay i think we'll go ahead we'll wrap up today we've had a marathon session so thanks everyone for hanging in there for these topics. And then we'll get some uh, time for next Thursday. I expect probably we need at least an hour for that transaction discussion, probably the whole meeting, but we'll see if any other urgent topics come up for next Thursday. All right, any last comments before we go ahead and let everyone go for today? Okay, thanks everyone. I appreciate uh, folks hanging around for the extended time so we could continue the discussion on this. Much appreciated and I'll talk to you soon. I'll go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>